But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Hey you, you look like you're interested in some FNAF lore. Sick of all the speculation? Do you want something that's undeniably canon? Oh. Well, that's too bad. I'm telling you anyway. The year was 1983, January to be exact. Local nobodies Henry Emily and William Afton were walking down the streets of Hurricane Utah when suddenly they noticed that not once in their life have they ever caught a glimpse of a yellow grizzly bear. It was then their fates were sealed, and they knew that they must fulfill their destiny. Henry and William were something of robotics enthusiasts, so they finally used their untapped potential to create the most realistic animatronic bear imaginable. On their first attempt, they made a decrepit, muddy yellow bear with giant teeth and claws. This wasn't realistic. William, however, remembered that in the trunk of his car rested a cluster of discs that could emit audio frequencies that would fool people into seeing real bears. They slapped those bad boys on this animatronic, and suddenly it took the form of the beautiful Golden Grizzly, who they then named Ferdinand von Bernard. Not only did he look the part and have a voice like honey butter, but the mind-altering audio accidentally gave him sentience and cosmic power beyond our human understanding. This was very dangerous, but the partners in furry shenanigans were not swayed. That is, until the entire town evacuated at the sight of this golden beast. Turns out, people are scared of loose bears. Who would have thunk it? Of course, this fear wasn't for nothing. Ferdinand was caught dining on a local restaurant owner, and he fled from the crime scene before law enforcement could get to him. William and Henry realized they had been a slight bit overzealous with their first creation. Good thing is, literally nobody knew or cared who they were, so they got away with this scot-free. Later that month, they designed an animatronic simply based on Ferdinand's likeness. This character was quite a downgrade, being both simpler and stupider. This didn't matter to the duo, though, as they loved their creation. And with that, Fredbear was born. At first, they had nowhere to actually put him, so they opted for the dump. He was truly a diamond in the rough. Amazingly, this attempt at entertainment was amusing enough to the citizens of Hurricane that they gave William and Henry enough money to afford a recently vacated diner space. Fredbear was going to be a star. Unfortunately, this animatronic was extremely poorly designed, and their attempts at granting him artificial intelligence quickly turned sour. On February 31st, 1983, his first performance on stage in front of children prompted him to spontaneously combust from a nervous breakdown. William and Henry, heartbroken at this tragic event, cracked down to ensure this would never happen again. This also prompted William to threaten the United States government, and they met his demands to strike February 31st from the calendar forever. After that, they set their sights on making something with no flaws. But then they made Springlock suits. In an attempt to both ease the animatronic's nerves and not allow them their legally required breaks, Henry and William created mechanisms that could lock the endoskeleton parts to the inner edges of the suit for a person to climb inside and cover for the character. For extra safety precautions, they created a partner for the new Fredbear 2.0 to ease his nerves. For some reason, the best name they came up with for Fredbear's partner was Spring Bonnie. William was insistent on this name, and Henry felt too threatened to argue against it. Where the safety precautions ended, however, was the fact that the spring locks holding the endoskeleton pieces away from a person's vital organs were made out of paper clips, and the lightest sneeze could set them off. Truly brilliant inventors, those two. The dynamic duo had now created a dynamic duo. William was the only one who had the nerve to actually test the springlock suit, and it turned out he enjoyed dancing around as a yellow rabbit a little too much. Henry was unbothered by this though, as William was still perfectly capable of handling their finances in character. A few months had gone by and Fredbear's Family Diner was an absolute success. Not only were Fredbear and Spring Bonnie beloved by the now enlightened Mormon population of Utah, William even managed to lock in a deal with a low-budget animation studio in order to make a cartoon called Fredbear and Friends. The one downside, though, was the studio needed more characters and they refused any more yellow ones. Out of obligation, Leopold, Theodore, Mirabella, and Foxy were created. No, Mirabella's not yellow, she's Xanthophil. You're just seeing things. Surely these blights to everything William and Henry stood for would never see the light of day in any other context. William and Henry were at their peak, and William finally regained custody of his children. However, one of his sons, whose name has been stricken from the record, waltzed into the back room of Fredbear's and saw Fredbear smoking a cigar. Fredbear's blatant nonchalance about his respiratory health was truly traumatizing for the child. In a panic, the child started to run out the door but accidentally tripped over the foot of Spring Bonnie. Unbeknownst to him, 
the animatronic was being worn by Harold the janitor, and this collision was enough to snap open the flimsy spring locks and impale Harold every which way. Harold's soul, heartbroken by his untimely demise and his boss's backup fursuit, transformed into pure agony and he became a shadow creature. He gave himself a really cool name, but unfortunately he never learned how to spell, so it came out like this. Shockingly okay with witnessing this occur, the child went home and invited his older brother, Michael, to play a game of Uno with him. However, there was foul play. This child was actually just a terrible human being and slid extra cards into the deck, causing Michael to draw four eight turns in a row. Enraged, Michael threw on a foxy mask and started screeching at the child. The child, annoyed by his behavior, decided to humor Mike until he got bored of doing this and pretended to sob 24-7. Maybe, just maybe, this would guilt trip him. However, Michael was far more resilient than the child anticipated, and this behavior kept going for a whole week. The child, craving literally anything else to do with his time, walked into Fredbear's again in an attempt to face his fears before getting cornered by Trevor the cashier wearing a Fredbear suit. The child saw the reasoning for this, as Trevor was holding a mat for a mediocre dentist's office in his hand, and so the child deliberately ran into Trevor to set off the spring locks in his suit. Trevor's spirit, a bit relieved by the matter in all honesty, turned into a more chill shadow creature that just kind of walked around convincing people to join his conga line. The child returned home, completely okay with the fact he just killed a man, and told his Fredbear plushie everything he did. 